Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third lecture in the hot series of the uh, homotopy type theory uh, uh, summer school in 2022. Uh, it is uh, my pleasure to uh, um, uh, welcome uh, Paige North here for the third time for her third lecture. Um, <clears throat> Paige is a, is a postdoc at the Department of Mathematics at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she's also a honorary research fellow at the um, School of Computer Science in Birmingham. And she has her PhD from Cambridge. Uh, she's, a, she's a topologist, a category theorist, and a type theorist. And it's a um, great honor to have Paige here lecturing at the, at the hottest summer school. Take it away. Thanks a lot, Egbert, and uh, it's great to be back again. Uh, tell you all about the amazing thing that is how much it be type theory. Okay, so let's start with um, a tiny outline of where we are in this course. So in the first lecture, we introduced uh, just dependent type theory in general, and pi types, these dependent function types, and kind of the special cases of regular function types and uh, product types. And uh, last time then, so the second lecture, we talked about inductive types, most inductive types of interest minus the identity types. And this, this uh, subject matter corresponds to sections three and four of Egbert's book. And this time we're going to be talking about um, the last inductive type, the identity type. And this is section five of Egbert's book. And the great thing is that finally in this lecture, we start to see some evidence of homotopy theory playing a role in the type theory. Okay, so. Let's start with uh, just some orientation, some information about why we need the identity type. So uh, one answer, of course, is that we might be really interested in homotopy theory. And we've heard that the identity type uh, gives some homotopical phenomena in the type theory. So uh, that's kind of maybe the obvious answer. And I'm gonna answer this question, even if we're not interested in homotopy theory. Okay, so uh, why are we even asking this question? Well, you might remember from the previous lectures that we already have a notion of equality. And we've been writing it like this. And I'm now going to start calling this judgmental equality. Equality. Um, and when I use the word judgmental equality, I am contrasting that with propositional equality, which is one way we could call the identity type. So the identity type that we're about to introduce for the equality, the notion of equality that the identity type gives us is called propositional equality. Okay, so we're gonna about judgmental equality versus propositional equality. Okay, so one um, answer maybe to this question, why do we need the identity type, is if we think uh, philosophically about the logical interpretation in this interpretation, uh, types are propositions and terms are proofs or we think of them as proofs. And so if we want to prove an equality, if we want to have a proposition that says something is equal to something else and we want to prove that proposition and we want to kind of uh, be consistent with this logical interpretation, then we want to produce a term of a type of equalities, right? So in this logical interpretation, proving an equality means uh, constructing 
a term of an equality, a type of equalities, which here will be the identity type. Okay, so I think throughout this lecture, I'm going to use equality, identity, and other words interchangeably. Okay, so that's one answer, one philosophical answer, but maybe there's a, a slightly better answer, a more concrete answer, which is that uh, we can prove many equalities, uh, many judgmental equalities using computation rules. We saw that in previous lectures. Uh, many judgmental Equalities. So, for example, in the last lecture, we defined the um, function add that adds two natural numbers and the computation rules for um, the natural numbers and function types told us that if we add zero to a natural number, then we get back the original natural number. This is you know, how we defined it. We kind of specified that add x zero should be x. And we also specified that add x s y should be s of add x y. So indeed, because we specified it that way, we get these judgmental equalities. So we can prove many, or we can derive, maybe I should say, many judgmental equalities using computation rules, but not all the ones we want. So for example, we cannot prove that add zero X. So the previous, um, the previous guy, but reversed, we cannot prove that this is X and we cannot prove that this is the successor of add X, Y. We can't prove kind of the other way around. And the reason is because if we want to prove this, so let's think about this one. If we want to prove this, we're going to have to do induction on X because we're trying to prove for all natural numbers X, add zero X equals X. And it's not just automatically given to us by the way that we constructed the function. So we're gonna have to use um, a technique, even in, in regular old mathematics, if, if you're coming from the side of mathematics, even in regular mathematics, if you want to prove a statement like for all natural numbers X, blah, 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 we have to use induction. And here, similarly, in our rules that define the natural numbers, um, the natural numbers elimination tells us that to prove something that starts with for all natural numbers x, we need to use natural numbers elimination, i.e. the principle of induction. So we have to do induction. But remember that natural numbers elimination, that rule, aka induction, uh, allows us to only to produce a term of a type. Right? So let me remind us here that natural numbers elimination, aka uh, induction on the natural numbers, looks like something like the following. So we start with a dependent type on the natural numbers, and uh, the rule asks for some hypotheses here. And if we give it the right hypotheses, then it will tell us how to find, I'm now just writing this very, very roughly, how to find an inhabitant of each one of those uh, propositions or predicates, the X, okay? So we can only using induction, we can only produce a term of a type. So this um, is very much in line with our logical interpretation where we, when it construct a term of a type. So in order to apply the principle of mathematical induction that we have so far in the system, we need a type of equalities in order to prove something like this. Okay, and we will indeed be able to prove uh, the propositional version of this. We will be able to prove that add zero X is propositionally equal to X. And similarly for the, um, the line below about successors, but we're, we're not gonna do that in this lecture. Uh, we will just see the example for add zero X. Okay, uh, another thing I want to talk about to help us maybe orient ourselves in, in what's going on 
is that uh, type constructors or type formers, as I call them in the last lecture, so type formers, type constructors, also an interchangeable piece of vocabulary, uh, often internalize structure. And I think this is a very good organizational principle to have in your mind. So for example, at a kind of meta or external level, we can, like as human beings looking at this type theory, we can talk about contexts. So for example, we could uh, have a context that looks like an X and A, a Y and B, a Z and C, maybe some uh, type declaration. Maybe I can notate the dependency explicitly here. Okay, so we can talk about contexts like this at a meta level, like as a person looking down at this type theory. Uh, but if we want to kind of talk about such concepts within the type theory, then that really means, or at least um, the practice is that that means that we would have a type of such things, like a type of context. So uh, we can indeed uh, form a type of such context. So we can discuss this at the, let's say, type and term level using sigma types, aka dependent pair types. So if we want to talk about um, context of this form, we could talk about a sigma type of x and a, y and dx, and uh, z in, or I want to put the z in front actually, uh, z in cxy. Okay, so this type has, uh, we can think of it as having terms which are triples of a guy in A, a guy in B of that guy in A, and a guy in C of those two guys in, in A and B. So this type represents all of the possible things that could uh, be occurring in this, this context, or the, the things that could, could possibly make up this context, I should say. Okay, so in that sense, we are internalizing the notion of context into a notion that can be captured or is captured by a type. Okay, similarly, we can talk about, um, or we can think about dependent terms as functions, or maybe I should say as some kind of meta function. So for example, we could have a context like this, x and a, y and b of x, and some term little c in big C of x, y. And we can think of this as a function that takes in x and y and spits out c of x, y. So it is definitely, it is appropriate to think of it as a function, but it's not a literal function, at least yet, uh, in the sense that it's not a term of a function type. Okay, this is just a kind of external function, but certainly the function types that we've learned about internalize this notion. So we can internalize such meta functions as terms of a pi type, dependent product type. So for this one, we can use um, pi introduction to kind of uh, curry things and get a C in for all X and A, for all Y and BX, C, X, Y. Okay, so similarly, we might say that um, bool, the type of booleans, the type of natural numbers, if you look at the exercises, you should be familiar, I think, with uh, the empty type and the um, unit type. 
these also uh, can be seen as internalizing external or meta notions. Like we all have in our brains already a notion of booleans and a notion of the natural numbers and the empty type and the singleton. Um, and so this is a way to put that into the type theory. Um, now I want to get a little bit ahead of ourselves and talk about the universe type, which will only appear in the next lecture. So I'm not going to talk about it very technically, but we, we have actually seen it already in Martin's Agda lecture, if you've attended that or watched that. The universe type internalizes the judgment A is a type, something like that. And certainly the reason why I'm explaining this is because uh, we'll see after we've given the rules for the identity type, we'll see that the identity type internalizes the meta or external notion of judgmental equality. So that's another more um, long-winded answer to the question of why do we need an identity type if we already have judgmental equality, the one with the dot above it that we've been talking about. Well, this is a way to internalize that, to turn that into a type. And so if we think of things as, if we think of proving things as producing terms of a type, we can finally really truly prove uh, equalities or identities. Okay, so let us now get a bit more technical and give the um, rules for the identity type. I want to write the word type here, identity type. Okay, and this follows the um, same pattern that we've seen for all inductive types. So first of all, we have identity or equality formation. And this says that if we have a type A, if we have two terms of type A, then we have a type like this, the type of equalities or identities between A and B. Okay, we also have an introduction rule, which gives us the canonical terms of the identity type. Maybe in the five seconds before I write this down, ask yourself what you think the canonical terms of the identity type should be. So the canonical terms of the identity type are the terms that witness that a term equals itself. So for any term, little a of big A of type big A, we have a term that witnesses, we have a term R sub A that witnesses that A equals A, right? That seems like the only canonical equalities that we should know about. Maybe I can make a note here somewhere that R stands for reflexivity. So if we think of uh, this identity type as a relation, then this rule is saying that it's reflexive. Okay, then we have the elimination rule, which says that uh, the behavior of the identity type is defined by how it behaves on the canonical terms. So we wanna say that if we have a, um, a dependent type dependent on an arbitrary term of the identity type, first of all, then blah, blah, blah. Uh, but what is an arbitrary term of the identity type? Well, we have to have um, one guy in A, another guy in A, and a equality between them. So that's now an arbitrary term of the identity type. And we're going to first suppose that we have a dependent type of predicate on this kind of thing, okay? And the uh, conclusion, of course, is going to be that with these same hypotheses, then we have some uh, inhabitant or proof of, or term of the XYZ. 
Okay, and so what do we need? What should be the hypothesis that we need to prove this? Well, it should be that the, um, the predicate or the dependent type D, X, Y, Z holds or has a term at the canonical terms. Okay, so what do the canonical terms look like? Well, there are these reflexivity paths. The only kind of parameter that's going on here in this reflexivity path is a term of A. So we need a hypothesis that A is an A or X is an A. And let's suppose that if X is an A, then we have some way of producing a witness or a term that this holds at reflexivity at X. Okay, so if we can do that, then elimination tells us that we have a term here, let's call it end equality D X, Y, Z, witnessing that D X, Y, Z holds. Okay, and um, the computation rule tells us that uh, if we have all the same hypotheses, let me just copy and paste them, and uh, we plug in the canonical elements, so we plug in an X and A, then we get back the thing that we started with. So we plug in X, X, R, X. This is the same as the piece of data D that we started with in big D, X, X, R sub X. Okay, so these are the rules. Uh, hopefully they feel relatively familiar after seeing all the other inductive types in the last lecture. I want to mention that you probably have noticed something is missing from all of these rules, which is to say a um, declaration here that we can be in any context. Okay, so I haven't added it in everywhere or anywhere because uh, I want to now start to increase the readability by kind of abbreviating things. And it's relatively rote to put in all these hypotheses gamma, as you can see. But they're there, just, just pretend like they're just invisible or something. Okay, so those are uh, the rules for the identity type. I want to mention, what time is it? So maybe I'm gonna mention and not um, explicitly describe that these are slightly different rules from what you'll find in uh, Egbert's book. So let me put a note here. So, of uh, or maybe watch out, uh, compare these with the rules in RICA. So the rules in RICA, um, I would call them based rules for based path induction, and these rules I would call for path induction. And they are equivalent. It, I mean, if, if you think of them defining two different types, the types are equivalent, or we could think of the one type, it has both, both elimination rules. Um, so let me write here, base path induction. Uh, right, so in different situations, when you're doing different proofs, one set of rules might be easier to implement than the other set of rules. So I would encourage you to know them both, but actually in all of the examples we do today, coincidentally, uh, these rules I've written down are the easiest ones to use. So we're gonna stick with these, but just know that there are, there are a different set of rules out there. And they're also in um, the lecture notes that you can find on GitHub that I've prepared, um, but I will just skip over that in the interest of time. Okay, so uh, let's think about uh, what I was talking about with internalizing things. So I was saying that propositional equality internalizes judgmental equality. So type constructors again, internalize structure. So we can talk about uh, judgmental equality. At a meta level. By which I just mean that it's not a type, it's just, it's just something else um, in our system that's not a type. So we could, for instance, have a judgmental equality like this. And we can also internalize this uh, at a type and term level. So 
we can internalize this using identity types. So I claim that if we know that X is judgmentally equal to D, then reflexivity at A or even at B uh, is a proof that A is propositionally equal to B. Okay, and this is because the rules governing how um, judgmental equality works, which we haven't talked about super explicitly in these lectures, but which are very explicit in Eichberg's book, tell us that, uh, so if A is judgmentally equal to B, then we could form this kind of type and we can replace A or B with the guy that's judgmentally equal to it and find that uh, in this case, we're replacing B with A since they're judgmentally equal. And we find that these two types are judgmentally equal. Okay, so it's one consequence of the rules uh, governing how equality works. So uh, we know these two types are equal. And we also know that uh, reflexivity at A is a proof that just A equals A propositionally. Then uh, since we just said that this type is equal to this type and this guy is in this type, the rules for equality say that it's also in this type. Okay, so if two types are um, judgmentally equal, then we can uh, exchange them in a judgment like this. So we can now write this. Okay, so now we, we find, uh, we've shown that we can write something down like this, which might look a little bit strange from first glance, but since A and B are judgmentally equal, they're really the same thing. So reflexivity at A is really, um, suffices. Okay, and from this, I think we can extrapolate and see that uh, reflexivity, this uh, kind of operation, turns judgmental equalities into propositional equalities. It internalizes the external notion of equality. Okay, so now let's start using the identity type. I think the first thing we want to establish is something often called functoriality. Maybe we're kind of putting the cart before the horse because we're going to, in a few minutes, talk about the fact that types look like uh, groupoids and in fact, even infinity groupoids. That's where the um, kind of category theory terminology is coming from. Uh, don't worry about that, it's just maybe some jargon that's not necessary to actually understand what we're about to talk about. Uh, functoriality means that functions act on paths. So of course a function, um, the functions that we've been discussing in type theory, they take in a term of one type, they return a term of another type. So of course they'd act on terms. That's what a function should be. But not only that, it acts on paths or maybe I think this is the first time I'm using the word path. It acts on paths slash, or paths by which I mean terms of the identity type. So I told you that I was gonna use identities and equalities interchangeably, those two words. Now I'm gonna use um, paths interchangeably. So we're gonna have three words and maybe even homotopies can be um, interchanged with these, these other words. We have four words, equality, identity, path, homotopy, depending on your, your perspective. Okay, so what does this, uh, this uh, slogan actually mean? So it means that for any two types, A and B, any function F from A to B, and any two terms, let's say A and A prime in big A, there is a function 
So we're going to call app sub f, so I guess uh, stands for applying f to a path, which takes paths or identities of this kind to paths or identities of this kind. So if we have an identity or a path living in the type A between two terms A and A prime, then we get another uh, path or identity living in the type B between the two terms uh, of F applied to the original ones from A. Okay, so now I want to, now that we're gonna getting into the real business of doing uh, type theory or homotopy type theory, I want to make a, something really clear about the practice of, of how we do this. So remember that as type theorists, we are super invested in conflating the notion of proposition and type, at least at this level. I guess we're going to learn in a few lectures that types are certain kinds of propositions, but at least philosophically, we love to conflate propositions and types. So every proposition and by proposition right now, I just mean um, like a mathematical statement like this, this mathematical statement that I made that is like a theorem or a proposition or a corollary or a lemma. So every proposition we make in type theory is really a type, right? Because we want to conflate propositions and types but we often write them uh, or in English, at least partially, which I've done here. So uh, here is a type, maybe I can use the pointer. Here's a type. There's a lot of English that appears before the type, but this English is a uh, part of the type that actually is what's going on in this statement. So let me write that down explicitly. So this proposition, by which I mean this one, uh, if you put the English and the, the math that I wrote all together just in type theoretic notation, it stands for the following type, or it is the following type, I should say. So I said, uh, for all A and B, right, for any two types A and B. So here I'm gonna write a pi type for all A and B in type. And now again, getting a little bit ahead of myself, I'm using um, a universe type here to do this quantification. Um, we haven't seen that yet. We'll see it in the next lecture. Um, but uh, to explain this, I just have to use that a little bit. Okay, so for all types A and B, for all functions F, from A to B for all um, A in A and A prime in A. So maybe uh, it's good actually for me to make a, a tiny note, hopefully something that's relatively obvious that something like this with the comma stands for, for all A in type, for all B in type. And similarly, this guy stands for, for all little A and A, for all little A prime and A, for just kind of abbreviating things a little bit to make it easy to read. Okay, so we're all capital A, capital B, F, A, A prime. We have a function, oops, I wanna use black again. We have a function like this to this. Okay, so uh, hopefully you can see that this quantification here, I wrote out in English just to make the statement easy to read for a human being but could also have um, just written it in type theory. And in fact, when I write an English sentence like this, uh, I mean this type. It's a way of, of writing this type, just using English words. Okay, hope that makes sense. All right, so now let's show this. So uh, I'm going to ignore this quantification because this is happening in the universe and we haven't talked about the universe yet. Like I said, that will happen in the next lecture. So uh, we, I want to show that there's a term app in, in this type.
Uh, it's not technically a problem to include this quantification, but just since we haven't talked about it yet, I'm not going to do that. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we want a we want a function here. in this type. And we know that uh, this is a, a, a big function type, right? We have a function taking in uh, arguments from this type, from this type, and from this type. So I'm going to do, uh, I think here, four uh, instances of implication introduction backwards all at once, since we've seen this now a bunch in the previous lectures. So we know that to prove a, um, or to produce a function like this, we want to, to go backwards in this proof. We want to assume that we have an F from A to B, an A and an, and an A prime in A, and some path from A to A prime in A. And from all of this, we need to produce something here in this type. Okay, so I've just um, done the uh, implication introduction rule to these four things all at once. So I've abbreviated four steps into one. Okay, hopefully that's clear. All right, so now we have to uh, we have to produce a term like this, and we see that uh, this stuff here looks exactly like what we need. What we start with in the uh, identity elimination rule. Let me actually copy and paste that so we can have it on the same slide and refer back to it. Okay, let's maybe put it here somewhere. Okay, so we see that um, there are gammas I think here, maybe I can place them here. So here's a gamma. Here's gamma, here's gamma. And we see that uh, we compare this kind of thing that we want with this kind of thing that we can get. We have something of the right form. Right? So this is this corresponds to the gamma. The A corresponds to X. This guy corresponds to Y. This guy corresponds to Z. And this guy corresponds to D, X, Y, Z. And we're looking, we're hoping to produce this guy. Okay, so we have these two hypotheses that we need to supply. This one is kind of, um, we, just, we just know what it should be just because of the pattern matching that we just did. We saw that uh, the D, X, Y, Z, or in this case, D, A, A prime P should be uh, this type. Okay, so I'm not gonna write down that hypothesis because it's kind of forced upon us. What we need to do is produce this one, which involves a little bit of thinking. So how do we do that? See, okay, so the gamma is F, and we are assuming that we have just one guy in A, and we need to produce something of our type where here we've uh, we started with the X and the Y in A, and we made them both X. Now I'm gonna kind of follow the notational convention here. We're starting with an A and A and A prime in A, and we're gonna make them both A. And the Z becomes reflexivity at X, but in our case, A. So uh, here we're going to have F A equals F A, right? The A and the A prime are now just both going to be A. Okay, so we have to have, oops, we have to have something in this type. And if we look at it, we hopefully recognize that we do have something in this type, right? It's just the equality F A equals F A. We know that those are the same, they look the same. And in particular, we have our canonical term, reflexivity at FA, which when it says that FA equals FA. Okay, so we've got what we want. And now we just need to kind of fill in all the terms. So here, uh, we're gonna call this end equals R F A A prime P. And then 
here at the bottom. We just have to do all of that abstraction. We have to abstract F, A, A prime, and T. So we're going to do lambda F, lambda A, A prime, lambda P from this guy. Maybe I can fit it in. R, F, A, A prime, P. OK, and so we found a function here. And the computation rule tells us that if we plug in what the data that we started with, then we get back um, what we started with. So if we apply this function to um, an instance of reflexivity, so if we happen to have something like A equals A here, and we apply the function, then we're going to get back reflexivity on the side of P. OK, so that's an important um, fact about equality, this functoriality that um, every function acts not just on terms, but on equalities. OK, so now with that, we have the tools to uh, prove what we were talking about earlier, which is that uh, add 0n equals n for every natural number n. OK, and we're going to use two facts which we computed in the last lecture in the um, question, question and answer session, which was that uh, add n0 is judgmentally equal to n, and add n uh, sm is judgmentally equal to s, add nm. Okay, and this is just because this is the, the data that we put in to the, the whole machine to define this function add. OK, so how do we prove something like this? So again, at the bottom, I'm going to write what we want. So we've got this guy that we want to prove. We have a function type here that we're trying to prove. We have a for all n and n. So we're going to do function uh, or implication or pi introduction backwards to assume n and n. And then we don't know what we're going to get, but we're hopefully going to get something in this type. Okay. And now we see that uh, we want to prove something that's a predicate on the natural numbers. So we're going to use natural number induction. Okay, so actually this, this problem, this example doesn't use any, um, any identity uh, elimination, just use a natural number elimination, but we're going to use the functoriality um, thing that we derived before in this. Okay, so we need to uh, produce those two, the two uh, pieces of data to get out this function. We have to, uh, we have to prove this when n is zero, and we have to prove it when n is of the form like successor of something else, of n maybe, uh, assuming that is true for n. Okay, so for zero, we have to prove that add zero, zero uh, equals zero. But we know this basically, right? We know this, so this is true uh, for all n. So we know this uh, is true actually judgmentally. And as we discussed a few minutes ago, that means that um, reflexivity, we could say uh, R sub add zero, zero, or R sub zero, those things are themselves judgmentally equal. Uh, those form proofs that add zero, zero is propositionally equal to zero. Okay, and the other thing we have to supply the, it, so this uh, thing was the uh, base case, now we have to do the induction step. Uh, so we have to, suppose we have a natural number n, suppose we have in hand some proof of this equality for that natural number n, then what we need is a proof of this equality for Sn, somehow using P. And we find, let me, I don't know if I want this to be part of the truth tree. Let me make it kind of separate. So we know that if we do um, the function application of S, this successor thing, I guess, thinking about it as a, a function, maybe I did 
some lambda abstraction to make it into a function and apply it to P. Then we find, uh, what do we find? We find S add zero N is equal to SN. Okay, and what we want of course is this, but we find by this judgmental equality that uh, this guy is equal, this type is equal for the left-hand side, maybe can erase some things. Uh, this side here is equal to this side by this judgmental equality. Okay. So again, just like reflexivity of uh, at zero is a proof that add zero, zero equals zero. This app SP is a proof that add zero SN equals zero. Right, using S applied to this guy and then using this judgmental equality. Okay, so now we successfully proved the base case and the induction step. And now we put it together with induction, aka natural numbers elimination, and we find here a term uh, R0, let's say app sub S, and, uh, and I want to put the N in there. And then to turn it into a function, we want to abstract N from this. I don't have enough space. And we find indeed this function. Okay, so now we've successfully proven that if we add zero on the left of any natural number, then we get back the original one. Okay, so let's take a break from computation and talk a little bit about um, maybe some real first glimpse at homotopy theory in this theory. So let's call this the groupoidal behavior of types. Okay, so let me see right here the first homotopical. Phenomena. Okay, so uh, we've already thought about types as sets, so we can maybe kind of think about geometrically as a collection of, of points. But now we have this notion of um, of identity or equality that I've already been calling paths and homotopies. So we can think of types as consisting of points, I mean, technically terms, but just like we think of terms sometimes as elements of a set or proofs of a proposition, we can now also think of them as points of a space connected by homotopies, which is a jargony word for uh, paths, maybe the more intuitive word. And these are technically speaking, the identities, the terms of the identity type. Okay, so let me uh, draw a picture here. So let's say this is some type A. We can visualize it in our mind as a collection of terms uh, connected, so this P and this guy Q, connected by some paths. Okay, so maybe like we're looking at the torus and we've got some, some points on the torus and we can walk it for a little ant on the torus from A to B and B to C. I realize that maybe there are some people here who don't know what a torus is, so um, bear with us. We'll, we'll um, make the homotopy theory hopefully intuitive via type theory, but right now I'm just trying to um, appeal to some intuition that people might have already from studying uh, spaces from a mathematical perspective. Okay, so what can we do with this? So first of all, one thing to note out note is maybe not what we can do, but what is possible. We can have multiple equalities of the same type. So for example, we can have a P in the type A equals B as I, I have in this drawing, 
So we could also have another witness P prime. We could also have a guy here, P prime. Okay, and uh, that's totally fine. And there's nothing saying that these two guys should really be the same. And so this is uh, maybe the first clue that the equality here in this type theory is not behaving in exactly the same way that equality in normal mathematics or normal life behaves. Right? We usually don't have two different proofs that two things are equal. They're just, they're just equal or not. So now we have two. It's possible to have two or more infinitely many uh, proofs that two things are equal or ways in which they're equal. Okay. We can um, prove, and we will in a second, that we can take the inverse or an inverse of an identity or a path. Okay, so if we have P from A to B, maybe I should just write, I already wrote P from A to B before, that P that A equals C. And now using that, I could also derive a term of this type. So I could draw an arrow backwards here, P inverse. Okay. So we can take the inverse of equality, which makes sense, right? If A equals B, then B should equal A. That seems um, not different from the normal notion of equality. We can also prove that we can take the composition or concatenation of two paths that meet up in the right way. So we have here in this picture a path P or an identity P from A to B, an identity P that A equals B, and Q that B equals C, and we can put them together. To produce um, a witness that A equals C. Okay, and another thing that is possible is that we can have equalities of equalities. So if we have this P and P prime that we talked about before, perfectly possible to have an equality of them. which we might call a nested identity type, right? Because we see these two equal signs and we can keep going. We can have equalities of equalities of equalities of equalities of equalities. And so we, we see this kind of, this tower of equalities. Okay, and here in this picture, maybe I just zoom in a little bit, we can uh, maybe denote this what I think I called it alpha as a uh, path here, kind of two-dimensional, surface between P and P prime. Okay, so uh, if you're familiar with homotopy theory or with algebraic topology, you know that this is how paths or homotopies behave. And if not, I'm just gonna tell you, this is too old. This is how homotopies aka paths in uh, spaces like a topological space behave. Okay, so uh, let's get maybe slightly more technical or well, not very technical, but let's uh, let me just give you the summary of something slightly more technical. So I have talked very vaguely before about the logical interpretation and the set interpretation. So um, I'm talking at a very loose, high level about these things because there's a lot of um, complicated categorical machinery that goes into making a statement like there is an interpretation of such and such into such and such precise. But by an interpretation, we just mean like when we look at type theory, we can interpret it into the world of propositions by thinking of every type as a proposition, every term as a proof, in the set interpretation, we look at every type and think of it as a set and every term as a element of a set. And now we have a space interpretation. And this one 
goes back to Blavatsky uh, in the early 2000s. So he showed that there is an interpretation of dependent type theory into, I'm gonna write spaces with a capital S, the category, so to be technical, the category of con complexes. Okay, so I want to, um, I understand probably that not many people actually listening know what con complexes are yet. So uh, for those of you who have encountered topological spaces in the mathematical context, I want to say that uh, for technical reasons that are very, um, just minute details, I would say, there is no interpretation, unfortunately, of dependent type theory into the category of topological spaces, but there almost is. So if you only know about topological spaces, I would say that it, it will be perfectly fine for your intuition to think about what I'm saying um, in terms of topological spaces. That's totally fine. It's only for technical reasons that you only have an interpretation um, really into the category of con complexes. Okay, so in this interpretation, we think of types as spaces. So by spaces, I mean technically con complexes, but like I just said, if you only know about topological spaces, that's great, I think, for, for intuition. Uh, we think about terms as points in the space or in the world of con complexes, we might say zero cells. We think about uh, equalities or terms of the identity type as paths in this space, or to be technical, uh, zero cells of the path object. Uh, if we are looking at sigma types, then we like to think not about a sigma type by itself, but of the projection of the sigma type down to its uh, indexing type here B that we defined in the last um, the last lecture. And uh, we think about this in the following way. I'm not sure what to put in this column here, what a non-technical word is, but a technical word for those of you who already know about these things is con vibrations. And we think about pi types as the space uh, the space of sections, the con complex of sections of that guy pi uh, that we wrote above. Okay. Uh, all right. So, yes. Yeah, so, so, I just want to make this point that there's this interpretation in the spaces. Um, these technical words are there just if you're coming from. The world of homotopy theory just so i can connect it with what you already know of but if you don't know about homotopy theory yet i think it's very i mean it's definitely 100 feasible to get a lot of intuition and to learn about it via homotopy type theory which is really what this course is about okay so let's go back to doing that so i said that uh, i said up here that we can take uh inverse and composition of paths so we can take for example uh, an inverse of an equality. Okay, so so for any a b in a, we have a function that turns an equality of the type a equals b into an equality of the type b equals a. Okay, so we want to. Uh, produce a term of this type. We do um, function introduction, pi, introdu uh, yeah, pi introduction uh, backwards as usual. So we can assume that we have these kinds of things and we want to produce a term of this. Okay. 
and the so we see that we want to prove something about an arbitrary equality between A and B. So we can use we just apply um, equality elimination, identity elimination, and for that we just need to prove this statement in the case that P is reflexivity. So A and B are going to be the same. P is going to be reflexivity. So we need something in here, in that type where A and B are the same. Okay, so now we need to produce a term of type A equals A. That's easy, we can use reflexivity. And now we can trace this uh, down. So we do uh, reflexivity, A, B, P. And here we want to abstract A, B, and P. And now again, I'm, I'm not writing three lambdas, I'm just combining them. Um, hopefully that's clear, but I mean by this really lambda A dot lambda B dot lambda P. And quality R, A, B, P. Okay, we can also prove composition of equalities. And I'm thinking about whether or not I should do that in the time remaining. Yes, perhaps I should. Okay, so we can also um, prove that we can compose two equalities. And so what do we mean by that? We mean that for all triples of terms in A, if we have an equality like this and we have an equality like this, then we get an equality like this. Okay, so maybe I'll just remark, I think this has been going on kind of subtly in the, in the lectures, but I just wanna remark that there's, um, there are parentheses, invisible parentheses here. And this kind of, type we often see when we're doing um, type theory functional programming. I think Martin mentioned something about this very briefly in his lecture that uh, especially to a mathematician, it might seem more natural to write something like this here instead of this. And uh, Mathematically, it's more natural. These two types are equivalent, but um, to to prove something or to use this type, we have to always kind of deconstruct this product and then reconstruct it. So there's a lot of extra stuff going on when we um, in in type theory or in functional programming, if we were to use this kind of description of what we want to do. Okay, so instead we just do a little trick, just set things up nicely for ourselves, and talk about this um, this kind of triple function thing um, that will make make things a little bit cleaner. Okay, hopefully that makes mathematicians a bit more comfortable. Okay, so we want to uh, prove something of this type. So as usual, we're just going to do function introduction backwards. So we're going to write a, B, C, and A, P and A equals B, Q and B equals, ah, I think I don't want to do this actually. I'm just gonna write, oh, maybe I will explain why I don't want to do this. Uh, I could just completely move everything over to the left as much as I can. And then over here I would write, I wanna maybe write a question mark. Something is in A equals C, A. Okay, I could do this, but I don't want to, and maybe to explain why not, I will grab again this uh, quality elimination. Okay, so let's look at equality elimination. So uh, equality elimination lets us do something like this. Here we have something like this. Uh, the problem is that we have, I mean, we could think about A, B, and P corresponding to X, Y, and Z, or we could think about um, B, C, and Q corresponding to X, Y, and Z. But unfortunately, in both cases, 
those guys are all mixed up, right? And we know that there's this uh, invisible gamma here. So we're allowed to have context to the left uh, that we're maybe not using um, very much in this, this equality elimination rule, but we're not allowed to have like other things here in these hypotheses, at least technically the way this is written down. Okay, so the fact that these guys, the these three guys are mixed up with uh, these other three guys, C, B, C, and Q, prevents us from using this rule um, just the way it's written down. Okay, so we're gonna do a little trick, I suppose, which is to not uh, move everything over to the left. We're going to keep this guy here. We want to move it over. We're going to keep this function on the right of the turnstile and not completely move it over to the left. Okay, and now we have uh, P, A, and B, which almost line up to uh, sorry X, Y, and Z here, but not exactly. But since A, B, and C don't actually depend on each other, there's no complicated relationship there or there's no relationship at all, we can just permute those three guys as much as we want. Okay, I won't justify that, but um, it is derived in uh, the first chapter or the first section of Egbert's book. So instead we can permute these guys if we want. And I think I will, just to be really clear, I will write them separately like this. So I have these three guys. And I have this equality, and now I still have something that I want to produce in this function type. Okay, and now we see that these guys correspond to these three guys, this thing corresponds to the invisible gamma, and this type corresponds to this type. Okay, so now it's all lined up. All right, so to do this induction, now as usual, we just assume that A and B are both the same thing, say A, and that P is reflexivity. So, here's another line, there we go. So the C is still hanging around because it's got gamma on the left. And we have a hypothesis that A is an A. And now we're assuming that A and B are the same, they're both A, and that P is reflexivity. So we need to produce something in this function type. And now we see we're quite lucky that we didn't actually have to completely unroll that whole function. Now we're in a position where it's quite obvious what term to produce. We can produce the identity function that takes any term to itself. I don't think we've given that a good name in the lectures yet. Maybe we could call it it or something. So that might be confusing with the identity type, but I'm just going to call it lambda x dot x. So this is the function that takes in a guy x in here and spits out the same guy x. In there. Okay. So now we, we produced that term. So now we just can follow everything down the line. Oops. Here we have A, B, P. And here, this is going to be exactly the same because we didn't do anything but permute the context in a way that doesn't affect anything. And then here, we're just going to abstract uh, A, B, and C. From this term. Okay, and we find a function that composes things for us. Okay, and we can think maybe precisely about what this does. So our computation rule gives us some handle on the, the behavior of this. It tells us that if, if we are in this situation like this, the one that we use to define the whole thing, where uh, A and A, or sorry, A and B are the same, then composing with a reflexivity path on the left as an arbitrary path produces that arbitrary path. Okay, so computationally, the computation rule 
gives us um, that composition is left unital, but it doesn't give us automatically that composition is right unital. But analogous to what we saw with the natural numbers, we can prove that um, up to a propositional equality. Okay, in the time remaining, I want to quickly talk about transport. This is also um, very important. And uh, maybe, well, let's see how much I can say about transport. Okay, what is transport? So transport says that for any dependent type, uh, let's call it X and B, DB type, any terms, B and B prime in B, and any quality P from B to B prime in B. There is a function. So we're calling TR B. Maybe I should put in more indices. Uh, let's just put in P here. There is a function like this that goes from EB to EB prime. Okay, so if we're looking at a dependent type and we have an equality in B, which we can kind of think of as not exactly a function, but you know, a path, a way to move in some sense from B to B prime, then that's in some sense transmitted to, oops, I have the wrong variable here. I want this to be X, line up with the X and B. So we want that to be transmitted to something going on with the E's, right? So a path in B and the indexing type B becomes a function um, of these E's. Okay. And actually when we, um, when we learn about universes, we'll be able to see that this is actually maybe uh, an equality or even an equivalence between uh, EB and EB prime, but we're not there yet. Okay, so it's just a function for now. And uh, I want to make some points about this philosophically. So this ensures that everything in the type theory, everything we can prove, everything we can construct respects equality. In the sense that if we can say, let's think about E as a predicate on the type B, if we can prove something about a particular guy, little b, and we know that propositionally B is equal to B prime, then we can also, uh, using transport, derive a proof of E B prime. Okay, so, uh, and, and of course, um, vice versa. We can go from a proof of E B prime to a proof of E B, if we know that B equals B prime using that inverse that we, we derived. So everything here, every predicate we can make respects equality. And if we think of E, maybe not as just a predicate, but maybe a really complicated construction of some sort with a lot of mathematical complexity, then that also respects equality in the sense that we can transport that construction along paths. Okay, I also want to make the note again, so this is for people who are very sophisticated in, in homotopy type theory. I just want to point out without saying something too specific that this is part of a more uh, sophisticated, we could say, relationship between uh, homotopy theory or axiomatic homotopy theory, categorical homotopy theory, and type theory. And maybe I wanna say actually by uh, homotopy theory, I mean, in this case, Quillen model category theory. Okay, so in some sense, there's a lot more here to be said, but I just wanna, um, just a uh, gesture towards something. Transport says that morphisms of this shape 
behave like vibrations in a Quillen model category. Okay, and there's some very close relationship here between um, the types and the behavior that's bestowed upon the types by the identity type rules and Quillen model category theory. That this discourse is not gonna get into, but I just wanna um, point that out for people who are interested in that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, right, let's derive transport really quickly. In the time we have left. So transport says that we're not gonna quantify over the type B because we don't have the tools for that yet. But for any two points of a given type B that we know about, or any path in, from B to B prime in B, for any guy in EB, we get a guy in EB prime. Okay, so we want something in this type. And now it will be. Um, what do we want to do? Okay, so again, we're going to be a bit tricky about what things we move over the turnstile, the invisible turnstile here, and what things we don't. So we're going to move over the ND prime. We're going to move over uh, a path from B to B prime. But now I'm not going to uh, move this guy over because, again, if I were to do that, then I would mess up uh, the way that this resembles the conclusion of the identity elimination rule. Right? We don't want to have something over here before the turnstile in that um, identity elimination rule. So I'm not going to keep um, currying or moving things over the turnstile. I'm going to now write this function here that's left. OK, whoops. And I need some space here. Okay, so we want to produce something like this. Hopefully now we've done enough examples that it becomes clear. We are going to use identity elimination because we're going to prove something about identities, right? We've got identities as hypotheses. And uh, we just want to assume that B and B prime are the same and that P is reflexivity. So if we assume uh, that we just got a B and we're looking at reflexivity, then we're going to write B everywhere for both B and B prime. And now again, we just need a function, but it's obvious. We take the identity function that sends every X to X itself. And now we can do identity elimination uh, and equals lambda X dot X. B, B prime and P and then we're just going to abstract these variables. Let me find such a term. Okay, and the computation rule tells us a little bit about its behavior again. So it tells us that if we're in this situation, if we've got a reflexivity path here that we're trying to transport over, it's just the identity function, which is hopefully is what we wanted, I think. Right? So if we transport along the reflexivity path, um, we don't change anything. Okay, so let's sum up here with a summary of what has happened and in terms of to what extent we have introduced homotopy theory into the story. So the homotopical content so far is what? Okay, so we saw that types behave like spaces, at least uh, I tried to give some intuition that there are points, there are paths, they behave a little bit like spaces. Uh, though this is part of a very robust connection that this course will not cover. Okay. Uh, however, the UIP, which I'm about to tell you what it is, uh, let me call it 
the principle of uniqueness of identity proofs uh, is consistent with what we've done so far, all the structure that we've introduced so far. Okay, so what is this? UIP is a statement that for all, okay, for all um, types A, for all uh, two terms A, B, and A, for all two uh, uh, qualities or paths, P and Q between A and B, that P and Q are themselves equal. Okay, so if this were true, I mean, it's not necessarily true, but it's consistent in the sense that we could add it or it's negation to the type theory and everything would be okay. So we can, um, so the type theory is agnostic in some sense about whether or not this is true. But uh, since it's consistent, since it could be added, uh, we could add it and everything would be okay. okay so in some sense, we could um, collapse all the homotopical information, we could identify all the all the proofs of equality, all the paths, and everything would still be okay. Um, in other words, or maybe to put the issue slightly differently, we still have an interpretation into the category of sets. So we can, at this point, we can think about types homotopically, we can think about their points, their paths, composition of their paths, higher paths, but we don't um, have any types that are absolutely something like a space and not something like a like a set, right? So let me let me say what I mean. So a set is a collection of points can be visualized like this. This is an example of a set, and a space is something like a circle. Okay, so a circle is very different than a set. And in particular, in the circle, we have a very interesting non reflexivity path here from B to B. This is an example of a, of, a, of a true space that's not a set. Okay, so what we have done so far, and what we have done so far, it's still sufficient to understand types, to think of them as sets. There's nothing in the type theory that's actually a space in the sense that thinking of it as a set is wrong. Does that make sense? So now our homotopical thinking is possible, but not really necessary in a sense. It's not necessary. Um, it's not wrong to think of things without the homotopical viewpoint. Okay, so um, what I want to say is that we will add things to this type theory, not in this lecture, but in future lectures that will force us to take the homotopical viewpoint, that the set viewpoint will not be sufficient anymore. So only with higher inductive types, but we'll see some examples um, in this course later. And the univalence axiom, so we have no idea what these things, these two things are, but I'm just doing some previewing. Only with the higher inductive types and the univalence axiom that we will learn about in the future of this course, uh, honest to God, homotopical uh, behavior or content uh, occurs, let's say. And in, when we do this, we won't anymore have an interpretation into sets, thinking of types as sets will just be wrong and we will have to graduate to um, an interpretation into topological spaces or into spaces, I should say, in particular con complexes. Okay, so that's a preview of hopefully the rest of this course, why you stick around, how we're moving, how we're um, uh, graduating in complexity here. Uh, I just wanna say that uh, now my lecture is over, this has been, um, this is the end of my three lectures at the beginning of the series been really great um, to talk to all of you guys to see all of the enthusiasm on the discord 
Uh, if anybody, any one of you sees me in real life, please come up and introduce yourselves since I, I can't see your faces now. That would make me very happy. Um, and I'm leaving you in the very capable hands of, of course, Martine, who will give a lecture on Wednesday, and Ulrich Bolkholz, who will continue the hot lectures on Friday. Thank you, Paige. Um, thank you so much for, for your three wonderful lectures. Um, are there any questions? I see a lot of thank yous in the uh, in the chat. <laughs> if not, then I'll I'll stop recording here.